have Richard Nixon up there, who used to live down the street from here. Right. Really? Nixon, yeah, he didn't live very far from here, maybe, what, about three, four miles? Yeah. Tops, over in the Upper Saddle River in Park Ridge. I didn't know, I didn't realize he was He lived was right a, down, a literally down the He's street from, from Jersey. here. Jersey. Yeah. So, good afternoon. What are you doing? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Good afternoon. And, uh, I'm going to talk about 1972 today. My name is Evan Weiner. I've been here before. I've been doing this thing for a long, long time. As I told you, I started in Rockland County in Spring Valley, about 10 miles from here, at uh, WRKL Radio doing a high school show, and about four miles from here. Uh, in 1978, John Lindsay and I crossed paths. Um, it was at a Democratic fundraiser. Uh, in 1978, and a very young Gerald Nadler was there. He was 31 years old at the time. Uh, I was 21 at the time, and I ran into John Lindsay, and Lindsay told me he was running for governor of the state of New York, and that sent me on my way in my radio news career because I ended up on WNEW after that. But I've told you those stories. I got a unique perspective on 1972. I was 16 years old. We're going to talk about the year 1972. It was the year of Watergate. It was the year of Nixon going to China. Uh, but I do have a unique perspective because um, when you're 16 years old in 1972, you should never have met the two centerpieces of the Watergate break-in. Richard Nixon, who I knew from about 1985 to about 1989, and Larry O'Brien, who was the head of the Democratic National Committee. And it was his office at the Watergate Hotel, or uh, the water, or the business part of the Watergate Hotel, that was broken into by the plumbers. So uh, it's kind of odd that I knew those two people, um, Nixon and Larry O'Brien. But I'm going to talk a little bit about 1972. Watergate wasn't the only thing that happened in 1972. But uh, Nixon would eventually face charges of impeachment because of what happened at Watergate. But long before the break-in at Watergate, Richard Nixon goes to China. Of course, now we hear virtually every day there's going to be a deal between the United States and China, a business deal. There are tariffs that have been slapped on to products from China. There have been tariffs slapped on to products that were supposed to go to the United States to China. But none of this really existed in 1972. In fact, there were no relations between the United States and China uh, between 1949 and 1971. That's Nixon meeting Mao Zedong. Another thing that happened in 1972, and I've given you this talk, Title IX, which gave women equal access to education in higher education uh, in colleges and university. Title IX is signed into law by Richard Nixon. That's Patsy Mink. The law is named after her today. That was one of the things that happened in 1972. There are the plumbers. Uh, James McCourt, Valigio Gonzalez, Frank Sturgis, Ingino Martinez, and Bernard Baker. They were the guys who broke into Larry O'Brien's office at the Watergate Hotel complex. That would eventually send Richard Nixon in front of Congress, except he never went because he resigned before they had the chance to impeach him in 1974. That is the Watergate. Watergate, it's an office building. People know it because of the break-in. The Watergate, the last, uh, the, not the last time because Bill Clinton was impeached, but Richard Nixon was never impeached. He resigned in 74. Jane Fonda, doesn't matter what you think of Jane Fonda today, 47 years ago, she was in Hanoi, sitting on a tank, denouncing United States military involvement in Vietnam. And there's the Vietnam soldier. Vietnam War continues, now uh, going on to its ninth year. It started in 1964 with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. It hit the plateau as far as men being in Vietnam in 1968 with 500,000 troops. By now, there's about 100,000 troops in Vietnam. The war looks like it's kind of coming to an end, and it does in 1973. But 1972, the United States is sputtering along in Vietnam. 
and more camp, more unrest in the streets because of Vietnam War. More protest, protest continues, uh, and in Vietnam, civilians also have problems with the U.S. military, and there are children running from the U.S. military uh, with firefights going on all around them. George Wallace is shot in Maryland in May of 1972. Wallace was running for president at the time. And in Munich, the Palestinians, an offshoot of the PLO, the Black September Movement, uh, barges into the Olympic Village. They uh, hold 11 Israelis, nine athletes and two coaches, hostage for a little while, the Munich massacre, all 11 Israeli coaches and athletes, two coaches, nine athletes, are killed at an Air Force base nearby, a botched rescue effort by the Germans. And baseball integrates. Well, not integrates, but they do. The first ever woman baseball umpire, Bernice Garrett, takes the field. She lasts one game. That happens in 1972. And uh, the troubles continue in Northern Ireland. Bloody Sunday would take place in 1972 in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Between 1949 and 1971, there was no relationship between the People's Republic of China and the United States. There had been propaganda on both sides about how awful the other side was. Cold War propaganda. Uh, there were trade embargoes. <laughs> there was diplomatic silence. Richard Nixon, when he runs for president in 1968, one of the planks in his platform is somehow to open up China to the United States. In 1969, the Soviet Union and China have some border skirmishes to the point where the Soviets are thinking of dropping a nuclear bomb somewhere in China. Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong, the dictator in Red China or Communist China. Remember when we called it Red China and Communist China? I did. I was in ninth grade in 1969. And that's what Stewie Gates called them, Red China and Communist China. Anyway, uh, Mao Zedong and Leonard Brezhnev, who is the Soviet uh, president, for lack of a better uh, term, uh, had a fallout. And Mao Zedong begins looking lovingly at Richard Nixon. It would take a couple years before Mao Zedong and Richard Nixon would meet on a date. It would take three years, actually, in 1972. But the United States and China resumed diplomatic relationships. No American had been, official American delegation member, had been in China since 1949 when Mao took over. The Chinese government was Chiang Kai-shek. They fled to Taiwan and set up shop Taiwan. Uh, meanwhile, Mao Zedong had the entire country. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek had an island. China's alliance, as I said, soured with the Soviet Union in 1969. They had some bloody border clashes. There's Mao Zedong. And Mao's looking, and he's looking, and he's looking, and he's trying to figure out, how do I get Richard Nixon's attention? Well, by accident. It happened. Mao believed that uh, had he become friendlier with the Americans, it would serve as a deterrent against the Soviet Union or the Russians. Nixon wanted China. He really wanted to open up China. Uh, and there, there he is. I want China. I want China. Richard Nixon there, uh, who was involved in everything. Uh, during the 1971 World, Tabus, uh, World Table Tennis Championships, or ping pong, a 19-year-old player by the name of Glenn Cowan uh, hopped on a bus that was loaded with Chinese ping-pong players in Nagoya, Japan. And he stood on the bus for 10 minutes, waiting for somebody to say hello to him. Cowan takes an initiative. I am going to open up the relationships between China and the United States. Well, the Chinese team was told not to talk to any Americans because the Americans uh, were the enemy. And why would you want to talk to the enemy? After 10 minutes, the silence is broken. Uh, Cowan meets with some of the players on the bus. He gets a scarf. He sends or he gives the Chinese, one of the Chinese players, a t-shirt. The Beatles, let it be, with a peace sign on it. 
Glenn Cowan thought he could really find the key to world peace in 1971. And the United States table tennis team was not all particularly that good. It was ranked about 24th in the world, and they had no funding. They had to go to Japan by literally begging, borrowing, and stealing money so they could play in this tournament. Meanwhile, table tennis in China is a big deal, a really big deal, except in 1965, during the Cultural Revolution, Mao Zedong decided to dismantle the table tennis team because it placed too much emphasis on winning. Chuan Zhang, who was the team's greatest player, stepped forward to shake Cowan's hand and speak to him through an interpreter. Happened to be that there were a lot of photographers there to capture this, and it made Mao Zedong extremely happy. All of a sudden, there's an opening. Also made Richard Nixon very happy. Uh, the Chinese players had arrived at the championships in Japan under strict orders not to have any contact with Americans. Chang Zhang is not just a good table tennis player, Mao Zedong observed. He's a good diplomat as well. The ball starts to roll. Nixon sends Henry Kissinger to Peking. Kissinger meets with Chou Enlai, the Chinese Prime Minister, and they begin in secret to talk about having Richard Nixon in Peking. And Richard Nixon would go to China. Nixon's journey into China is seven months after Kissinger and Chou Enlai meet. And uh, 1971, Time Magazine. Time Magazine, if you might remember, was once a big deal. Time Magazine, Newsweek, U.S. World, as a friend calls it, U.S. World and Distort, U.S. World and Report, uh, were all big things in those days, the weekly magazines. China, a whole new game. First color photos, Yanks and Peking. And here's the team at the Great Wall, and there's Cowan, the 19-year-old. U.S. ping pong players at the Great Wall. My wife knew Cowan as a kid. He used to play table tennis or ping pong at the beach clubs in New Rochelle, New York, on Long Island Sound. Um, his father pushed him into ping pong, bought him the best of rackets, 200 bucks in those days. Um, never before in history has a sport been used so effectively as a tool of international diplomacy. Said the Chinese Premier Chou Enlai, for Nixon, it was the week that changed the world. And it did change the world. Finally, Nixon, the handshake with bouncy tongue. Nixon looks happy. Here's a man absolutely devoid of any sense of humor. No sense of humor. Actually, devoid of personality, too. I dealt with him for a few years. Uh, however, Nixon does a few things. He changes how politics is played out on TV with the 1960 presidential election. You better look good. Nixon looked terrible in the debate. 1968, Nixon goes on TV, and he paves the way for Bill Clinton to go on Arsenio Hall and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger to go on Jay Leno to announce he's running for governor by saying, sock it to me? So a man without personality, who has no sense of humor, somehow becomes president of the United States and somehow goes to China, Richard Nixon. Nixon noted that the Chinese leaders took particular delight in reminding me that an exchange of ping pong teams had initiated a breakthrough in our relations. They seemed to enjoy the method used to achieve the result almost as much as the result itself. Mission accomplished. Mao Zedong, Richard Nixon have dinner together. In 1972, the United States still recognized the Nationalist Party over in Taiwan as the legitimate government of China. Despite that the Nationalists had retreated to Taiwan and no longer controlled any of the mainland territory of China. Oh, look at Nixon. He's in his element there. He's hanging out with Mao Zedong, and they're talking about where do we go from here besides dinner. He did go to dinner with Mao Zedong. Uh, Nixon's visit to China jump-started the process of normalizing relationships between the People's Republic of China. It was no longer Red China at this point. It was no longer Communist China at this point. That's all I read when I was a kid, when I went to school in social studies. 
Red China, Communist China. But it wasn't Red China anymore. It was the People's Republic of China and just plain old China eventually. Uh, and Washington governments, Nixon, Ford, Carter, started distancing themselves from Chiang Kai-shek and Taiwan. Taiwan was left out there literally on an island. China was the big dog now. The Shanghai Communique. Nixon meets with Mao Zedong, February 21st. The two leaders had a serious and frank exchange of views on Sinai-U.S. relations and world affairs. Remember, the United States is still in Vietnam, and Vietnam is really close to China. During the visit, they had extensive, earnest, and frank discussions. Nixon and Chou Enlai, who's the premier of China, about how you go about normalizing relationships that haven't been there for 23 years, uh, and also matters that uh, were of concern to both sides. Hey, look at me. I'm at dinner with these guys. Uh, do I have to use chopsticks? You open the door. <laughs> yeah. He's, look at him. He's just, he's just happy watching them eat. Nixon had a good old time in China. Really good old time. Oh, I'll have some of that. There's Nixon, Cho Enlai, eating. Uh, Nixon visited Peking, now known as Beijing, viewed the cultural, industrial, and agricultural sites. Also went to Hangzhou and to Shanghai. Continued discussions with Chinese leaders and also went to see other places uh, while he was in China. Hey, he's reviewing the troops. Not the American troops, the Chinese troops. And he's out there in front all by himself, and uh, there's poor old Pat Nixon. Pat Nixon is behind him, uh, also surveying the troops. And look at him. He looks so happy that he's looking over the troops. Are the troops okay? Uh, oh, yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. <laughs> the leaders of the People's Republic of China, no longer Red China, in the United States found it beneficial to have an opportunity to talk after 22 years without contact to present candidly to one another their views on a variety of issues. Nixon accomplishes something that nobody ever thought would happen. He goes to China, and he opens up China. And he got that dirty end of the stick. Yeah. Now, 1972 is also a big year for women's lib, particularly women in college. Now, most of you went to college before 1972, correct? Now, I'm going to ask you, what were the choices women had for professions, for the most part? Because there are some exceptions to the rule. Teaching and nursing. Teaching, nursing, and what's the other one? Becoming a secretary. Teaching, nursing, secretary. I was just in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago, and this thing caught my eye in the old um, museum there of pinball machines and, and Nickelodeons and, and all, the uh, Musée Magnifique on the uh, wharf in San Francisco. And I'm thinking, I'm looking at this, and this is probably 1940, well, actually this goes back to the 19-teens, but this is the old thinking. To be happy, see what every married woman must not avoid. You have to please your husband, right? That's your number one job. Pleasing your husband, having the kids, but pleasing your husband, which included having meals on the table when he came home, correct? Mm -hmm. correct? Having the kids bathe, having the kids do their homework, while the men do things like watch Huntley Brinkley and Cronkite, and then watch no, a game. No, work. Work, and, well, and work. So, to be happy, see what every married woman must not avoid. Women had to please their husbands back in the day. And in the 1960s, that started to change. Actually, it started before that. By 1972, women would get equal opportunity to education, higher education in the United States. About 6% of medical school were made up of women in 1972. About 7% law school. Those numbers have flipped. The majority now today are women in both medical school and law school. Taking over. <laughs> taking, and that's what you said. He said taking <laughs> over. But you're from a different generation. <laughs> the Patsy T. Mink Equal, uh, Equal Opportunity and Education Act. 
the Educational Amendments of 1972 or Title IX. In 1971, the Congresswomen, Patsy Mink of Hawaii and Edith Green of Oregon, gave women an opportunity to pursue their dreams. 1972, June 23rd, 1972, without much fanfare, Richard Nixon changes the lives of hundreds of a million, hundreds of millions of American women for generations to come. He signs the Title IX Education Amendments into law. The sponsors are Birch Bayh in the Senate, Edith Green in the House of Representatives. Title IX prohibits sexual discrimination in any educational program or activity receiving any type of federal financial aid. That was not taken care of in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. It would take another eight years for women to get equal educational opportunities. This is the third in a series of amendments, civil rights amendments, that takes place in the United States since 1964. There's Mink. Betsy Mink was a great athlete. She was a basketball player at Maui High School. But more importantly, she also was a victor uh, the valedictorian of her class, 1944. <coughs> at Maui High School. She was also the president of the student body. She ended up at the University of Hawaii, got great grades at the University of Hawaii, applied to 12 medical schools. How many of those medical schools accepted her? How many? Any guess? How about zero? How about zero? She was rejected, despite having all the qualifications for medical school, 12 times. Patsy in the middle. Uh, as I said, first female president of uh, the student body at Maui High School, number one in her graduating class. She goes to law school, goes back to Hawaii. There's a story about law school, too. She remained politically ambitious. In 1958, she was elected to the territory of Hawaii Senate. That would dissolve when Hawaii became a state in 1960. She ran for Congress but lost to Daniel Anoye. Uh, in 1960. In 1962, she ran for the Hawaiian State Senate, was successful in her bid. Two years later, she won the congressional seat. She was an early supporter of a successful effort to allow female members of Congress, female members of Congress, to use the congressional gym. <laughs> if you're a woman in Congress, and there were women in Congress, uh, going back for a long, long time, Jeanette Rankin was elected to Congress from Montana in 1916. If you were a member of Congress and you were a woman, you could not use the gym. You couldn't use the congressional gym until she came around. She was a champion of women's rights. She avoided being characterized as a feminist. In the 1960s, she became an outspoken opponent of the war in Vietnam. Uh, she worked tirelessly on behalf of legislation in the fields of civil rights, including those of women and children, <coughs> as well as health care, <coughs> welfare, and education. She was rejected from medical school, so she decided to go to law school. Her belief she was rejected from medical school was because she was a woman. She does go to law school, graduates, then goes back to Hawaii and tries to pass the Hawaiian Law Board. She fails. Why? Well, it's not because she couldn't score well on the test. She married a mainlander from Chicago. And because she married a mainlander, she lost her Hawaiian residence. She now was one of them on the mainland. Hawaii was a territory, even though she was a United States citizen, because Hawaiian territory was made up of the United States citizens. But she couldn't take the bar exam. She would successfully sue. She would win. She took the bar exam and became the first Japanese-American woman lawyer in Hawaiian history. She was in Congress, 67 to, uh, 65 to 77, and 1990 to 2002. Wow. Here's Patsy Mink on the left. On the right is Edith Green of Oregon. In 1954, she was elected a Democrat to Oregon's third congressional district. In 1955, she proposed equal pay for men and women in the same job, 1955. 
Let me ask you, 64 years later, is there still equal pay in every job that a man and woman can do, equal jobs? Is there equal pay? No. The answer is no. She proposed it in 1955. Edith Green, Democrat for Congress. Edith Green, the Library Services Act, provided access to libraries for rural communities. Uh, the Higher Education Facilities Act of 1963. Higher Education Act, 1965, 1967. She was known as the mother of higher education and Mrs. Education. How many of you had children in the 1960s? You had children in the 1960s, boys or girls? Boys. Boys. Anybody have girls in the 1960s? Well, that's an important distinction because after-school programs were geared for boys. I, I was a, I was a, I was in I was yeah. a child then. I can tell yeah. you there was no nothing for girls. Nothing for girls. There was nothing for girls. It was all for boys. Edith Green noticed this, and Edith Green started to point this out, and she fought to introduce bills uh, that would contain provisions for gender equity for after-school programs for children, because girls did not have many opportunities after school, certainly not like the boys did. Yeah, so when I was in, in junior high, then they started to have them. Yeah, when because we were in junior best. high. When we were in junior high. So that was sep the early 70s. Early 70s, okay. So things changed by the early 70s. <laughs> Title IX, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits, or subjected to discrimination under any federal education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Now, that got some people really upset back then in 1972. Some people even said, if we passed Title IX, it would be too dangerous. It would be forcing schools to accept women, and women would ruin education. <laughs> they would ruin education. That's as recently as 1972. 1972. That was the feeling. Women go to college, women go to medical school, law school, it's going to ruin the whole thing. It's going to kill the whole thing. But they did. Ted Stevens, the Alaska senator, the Republican, uh, according to my friend Donna Deverona, who won two gold medals in the 1964 Tokyo Olympics swimming, her, uh, one of her uh, mailboxes was gold to gold at AOL.com. She said to me, Ted Stevens was the guy that put it over the top. There is Donna Deverona, uh, my friend who I need to talk to because i got to update my uh, Title IX talk. She's been very helpful along with a woman by the name of Nancy Hodshead, who's now teaching at Rutgers University. Nancy also won a gold medal in swimming in the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics. She's a lawyer. Donna said, without Senator Stevens as the co-sponsor, I doubt Title IX would have survived. It was a time when we needed a strong Republican. He championed the rights of athletes and protected Title IX, as well as always being there when there was a challenge to the law. And there were many challenges to the law. Remember, it was going to ruin uh, education having smart women around. Stevens was an avid tennis player. He threw the value in sports and recreations, not only for himself, but for his daughters. Uh, in, his in his professional and personal life, Title IX would eventually provide women equality in sports. And there's, uh, <laughs> there's Ted in the middle. There's Donna Deverona. That's my friend Harvey Schiller. Harvey is a madman. Uh, Harvey had his shoulder replaced and on Facebook put up the pictures of the x-ray showing people that he successfully had his shoulder replaced. Harvey was also a flyer in Vietnam, 1966-67, worked for Ted Turner when Ted Turner was married to Jane Fonda. That was an interesting, as Harvey pointed out, an interesting time in his life. He is a Vietnam vet. Uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Harvey Schiller retired. Birch Bay, Indiana Senator, Democrat. Now, I'm at Spring Valley High School. 1969-70, I'm in ninth grade, so I don't know if it's the 69th part or the 70th part. But I had a social, study teacher, a social studies teacher by the name of Stewie Gates. Stewie Gates was probably about 45 years old at the time. Uh, guy with a short haircut, horn rim glasses, 
a man of his time, social studies teacher. In fact, he was the one that kept saying it's red China, it's communist China. But one day he decides he's going to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with all of us. I'm 13 years old, I'm a year ahead. Everybody else is 14 years old in the class. Anyway, he's having a heart-to-heart -heart with all of us. And he starts waxing poetically that we're leaving Spring Valley Junior High School, that it's coming to the end of an era for us. Our years at junior high school are over. We're in ninth grade. Next year, you go to a new building. You go into Spring Valley High School in 10th grade. And you take the PSATs in 10th grade, practice SATs, to see where you are in the SATs. Then in 11th grade, you take the real SATs. You get your scores back. And then in 12th grade, you figure out what college you're going to go to and what your major is. And this is only for the women in the class, only the girls in the class. The guys don't have to listen, only the girls. Some of you girls are going to go to college for three letters. You're going to major in three letters. What were the three letters? You don't know the three letters? I never heard this, but I don't know what it was. MRS. Right. MRS. Now, I bring that story up because Birch Bayh has his version of that story on the Senate floor. By author that introduced the Title IX Amendment of the Higher Education Amendments of 1972, which would pers uh, prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex in the classroom, athletic field, protecting students and faculty. And there's a later picture of Bayh. Now, let's talk about Birch Bayh's speech on the Senate floor. And think about Stewie Gates, because Stewie Gates gave me this talk in 69, and Birch is on the floor of the Senate in 1972. We're all familiar with the stereotype that women are pretty things, who go to college to find a husband, and who go on to graduate school because they want a more interesting husband, and finally marry, have children, and never work again. The desire of many schools not to waste a man's place on a woman stems from such stereotype notions. But the facts absolutely contradict these myths about the weaker sex, and it's time to change our operating assumptions. While the impact of this amendment would be far-reaching, it's not a panacea. It is, however, an important first step in the effort to provide for the women of America, something that is rightfully theirs. An equal chance to attend the schools of their choice, to develop the skills they want, and apply those skills with the knowledge that they will have a fair chance to secure jobs of their choice with equal pay for equal work. Birch Bayh in the Senate sounded like Stewie Gates a little bit. Now, when I give my long talk about Title IX, I give examples. I'll give you one example of a guy uh, who's in Stanford, uh, Connecticut, was telling me the story. He went to medical school in 1960, and there were 96 people in that class, 92 men, four women. And the dean of the school asked the four women to stand up and said to them, what are you doing here taking a man's place? You're wasting time. You're wasting your time. You're wasting our time because you're going to meet someone, get married, have children, and never practice medicine. That was the standard back in those days, which is why Birch Bayh said what he did on the Senate floor. Title IX was a follow-up to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The 64 Act was passed to end discrimination in various fields based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, in the areas of employment and public accommodation. But, but, the act did not prevent sexual discrimination against persons employed at educational institutions. If you're a woman looking for tenure, they could say no and don't have to tell you why. If you're a woman looking for a promotion and you know you got the goods to be promoted and you don't, they don't have to tell you why. 1972, they had to tell you things. Women students were denied equal opportunities under the law in academics. Uh, women applicants routinely were denied access to medical, law school, graduate school. Women athletes were denied equal participation in sports. Female faculty members were denied equal compensation and promotion today. 
Women in all academic disciplines and in sports on every level have benefited from Richard Nixon signing the Title IX law into the Title IX Act into law. Congress passes the final version of the bill, June 1972. Nixon signs it into law, June 23rd. Says nothing about it. Changes the lives of hundreds of millions of American women and families. Says nothing about it. Title IX has gone back to Congress, been challenged by 2007, 24 times. Oh, I signed the bill. I signed it. And he did sign it. Uh, he talked about the segregation, busing, expansion of uh, women's educational opportunities. Doesn't say a word. Meanwhile, there's Bernice Garrett. Roughly at the same time Nixon is signing the Title IX thing into law, Bernice Garrett gets the okay to become a professional umpire. Uh, in 1969, she went to umpiring school. She was aboard the Queen's housewife. And she was talking to her husband one day. And her husband says, well, do something. She said, I don't know what to do. He says, you like baseball. Why don't you become an umpire? She went to umpiring school. And she did well in umpiring school, well enough to get a contract from the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues to work in the Class A short season New York Penn League in 1969. But wait a minute, you're going to have a woman on the field, you're going to ruin baseball. You're absolutely going to ruin baseball. No women on the field unless they're playing in that Phil Wrigley League, the league of their own. Now, we don't need that, and besides, women might cry. Remember, Tom Hanks, there's no crying in baseball, league of their own. Anyway. Guerra receives a telegram in 1969 from the president of the NAPBL, Philip Pitton, informing her that her contract was disapproved and invalid. Why? Because they wanted it. She wasn't going to take this line down. She decides she's going to sue. It took her three years, but she finally won her court decision. That was on June 24th, 1972. She umpires a Class A baseball game between the Geneva, New York Rangers and the Auburn, New York Philadelphia Phillies. This is entry league baseball. These are high school all-stars at the age of 18 on the road to becoming professional baseball players. Only 2% of the players in that league ever get to the major leagues. New York Penwick. There's a disputed play, a double play. And the Auburn manager, Nolan Campbell, is in no mood for Bernice Guerra. She reverses a double play call against Nolan Campbell. She resigns between games of a doubleheader. She only umpires one game, citing the lack of cooperation from her fellow umpires. During the argument on the field, Campbell told Guerra she should be in the kitchen peeling potatoes. She left. Equal Rights Amendment is still out there, hasn't been passed as a constitutional amendment. Might be soon. It's got up to 37 um, states that have said yes. The Equal Rights Amendment, provided, which would provide legal equality of the sexes, was passed by the Senate March 22nd, 1972, sent on to states to vote. If 38 states say yes, the ERA becomes a constitutional amendment. 1923, Seneca Falls, New York, the celebration of the 75th anniversary of the 1848 Women's Rights Conference, a woman by the name of Alice Paul introduces the first version of the Equal Rights Amendment. It was called the Lucretia Mott Amendment. She would update the doctrine in 1943. Alice Paul was one of these women in the 19 teens who is willing to die to get the right to vote. So much so that she was arrested and put in an asylum while she was on a hunger strike. Here in New Jersey, there's an Alice Paul Institute. You can learn all about Alice Paul and her fight for women's rights. She did live through 1972 to see the Equal Rights Amendment uh, passed by the Senate and sent on to voters. There is Alice Paul. Alice Paul is an interesting character in history. Again, this is a woman who would rather 
starve to death, who would starve to death if she would never, wouldn't be able to vote. Of course, in 1920, she was able to vote uh, for president, but not every woman was able to vote in 1920. Chinese women were exempted from voting. Men and women shall have equal rights through the United States in every place subject to its jurisdiction. According to the ERA 1972, uh, that was uh, introduced in Congress. Uh, it was sent to the states. It's never been ratified. It needs the approval of 38 states. 37 have said yes. Five have withdrawn support, but they may come back. It needs one more state to become law. Oh, there he is. Okay. Now, I think I started out by saying I have a unique perspective on Watergate. For somebody my age, 63, considering Watergate took place in 1972, and I was nowhere near the Watergate Hotel, or Richard Nixon, or Larry O'Brien. But through various flukes of life, I got to know Nixon. And I got to know Larry O'Brien. Larry O'Brien was the commissioner of the National Basketball Association. And I got there around 1980. He was there through 1983. Richard Nixon comes back into prominence in 1985 by becoming the arbitrator of the baseball umpires dispute. And I remember going to his office in 1985, and there it was. It was a miniature Oval Office. And he has pictures here with Bouncy Tug and there with Anwar Sadat and the desk is there and the chair is there and it's empty. And I'm there with Gene Oser and Arthur Shack and the three of us, if we had cell phones in those days, we would have had a thousand pictures of each one of us in Nixon chair and Nixon's chair saying, Oh that crook, oh that crook, oh that crook. Now, President Nixon is running for re-election in 1972. The committee for the re-election of the president. That's his committee. Shortened, it's called creep. Think of that. This guy, Richard Nixon, is running for re-election, and the committee to re-elect him is called creep. Committee for re-election of the president. Creep. That should have told you something right then and there. The Vietnam War continued, and Nixon was paranoid, and he had good reason to be paranoid. The Vietnam War continued. The American economy was a mess. In the 70 midterms, the Democrats won the popular vote in the House eight point, by 8.7 percent. They pick up 12 seats. In 1971, Nixon's approval ratings dropped below 50 percent, and he's getting worried. His main target, the guy he wanted to get the most dirt on, was Edmund Muskie, who was uh, Hubert Humphreys, running mate in 1968, and Muskie was, uh, let's put it this way, the media wasn't too kind on Muskie because Muskie showed emotion and cried, and of course real men don't cry, especially if they're running for president. Uh, but Muskie was the guy that Nixon and his allies were going after. They wanted to get dirt on Edmund Muskie in Maine. That's G. Gordon Liddy. G. Gordon Liddy would eventually be rewarded by my industry with a talk show on radio. G. Gordon Liddy was a lawyer who uh, worked with Nixon. And it was G. Gordon Liddy, the general counsel to the commission, committee for the re-election of the president, or CREEP, who tells people, why don't we wiretap the Democratic National Committee's headquarters at the Watergate complex in Washington, D.C. So G. Gordon Liddy in January of 1972 says, let's bug Larry O'Brien's office and get dirt. Not only on Edmund Muskie, but we'll get dirt on everybody else. And there's Larry O'Brien, a guy who I knew for about three or four years. Uh, O'Brien had been a veteran of Washington Wars. He was part of the inner circle for the Kennedy administration. He was Lyndon Johnson's liaison to Congress. He knew his way around Washington. May 17th, wiretaps are placed on the telephones of the Democratic National Committee Chairman O'Brien and the Executive Director of the Democrat State's Chairman, R. Spencer Oliver Jr. Then comes the big show. On, Jan on June 17th, Frank Willis, 
a security guard at the Watergate complex calls police at 1.30 in the morning. Five men are arrested inside Larry O'Brien's office at the Democratic National Committee's headquarters. They are Virgilio Gonzalez, Bernard Baker, James W. McCourt, Eugenio Martinez, French Georges. All are attempted with, uh, all are charged with attempted burglary and attempted interception of telephone and other communications. This wasn't the first time that Nixon's guys broke into an office. They broke into the psychiatrist's office, Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist, Louis Friedberg, in 1971. Ellsberg had released the Pentagon Papers. Nixon was very upset about that. Somebody came up with a plan, let's get dirt on Ellsberg. Yeah, let's do that. So they break into the office. Well, Ellsberg's lawyers didn't find out about that until the trial. When the judge found out about it, he overturned all the charges and let Ellsberg go. They should have put a stop to breaking into people's offices. They didn't. They broke into uh, Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office and also Watergate. It's Nixon is still going on. Well, Nixon, Nixon went criminal. And there are two young guys. Bob Woodward, the Yale, the Ivy League guy, Carl Bernstein, the police reporter, the street reporter, guy who I, basically I was a street reporter. They needed Carl Bernstein, the police reporter, to actually do this because yeah, Woodward's an Ivy guy, an Ivy League guy. You know, they don't, you know, they don't think of things that go out on the streets. I can tell you things that go on the streets. I can tell you how we got advantages as a reporter on the streets. Bernstein knew all the angles. On June 19th, Woodward and Bernstein revealed that one of the Watergate burglars was James McCord, Republican Party security aide. There is James McCord, one of the five. June and July, the reporting continues, and the Washington Post is getting all these little messages that maybe you shouldn't do this. Anyway, Woodward and Bernstein reveal that they have a source, Deep Throat. The examination of the burglar's accounts show the link to the 1972 Committee to Re-elect the President, or CREEP, through its subordinate financial committee. Presidential election of 1972. Me, Richard Nixon, George McGovern, war hero, World War II, peacenik now. Nixon destroys McGovern, wins 49 states. McGovern only get, wins one. McGovern makes a mistake on his vice presidential pick, taking Thomas Eagleton of, of Missouri. Eagleton revealed that he had undergone therapy for a nervous breakdown. It's replaced by Sergeant Schreiber. Nixon is coast to a victory. Oh, there he is. Hi, hi, I'm not You gonna vote for me? There he is. 1972 with a bunch of young kids. On August 29th, Richard Nixon, speaking at a news conference, stated, I can say categorically, uh, categorically that no one in the White House staff, no one in this administration presently employed, was involved in this very bizarre incident. Well, we have learned that a lot of people were involved in this bizarre incident over the years. So Nixon tells a lie. That's the face you make when you tell a lie. <laughs> On August 30th, Nixon announces that John Dean, the White House counsel, has completed an internal investigation of the Watergate break-in. And guess what? John Dean finds no evidence. Gee, I wonder how that happened. John Dean eventually would go to jail. No evidence of White House involvement. But these guys continue the long-haired Carl Bernstein and the conservative-looking uh, Bob Woodward. Bernstein has sources on the street. When you're a cop reporter, you always have sources on the street. It may not be the best sources in the world in terms of bringing them home to dinner and introducing them to the family, but they're valuable sources. And I used to have those when I was out in the street. September 29, 1972, the Washington Post reports that Nixon's former Attorney General, John Mitchell, once controlled a secret fund to finance intelligence gathering against the Democrats. 
When Bernstein calls Mitchell for a comment, Mitchell threatens Bernstein and Catherine Graham, the publisher of The Post. Uh, they weren't going to cower to Richard Nixon. They printed the threat. And there's Edmund Muskie. Muskie was the guy. They wanted to get the dirt on him, find out what corruption Edmund Muskie was involved in, or whatever they could find on Edmund Muskie, except he did not get the nomination in 1972. October of 72, Woodward and Bernstein report that the FBI had made connections between the Nixon aides and the plumbers who broke into the Watergate complex. Woodward and Bernstein described the existence of major dirty tricks, dirty tricks campaign against Edmund Muskie, orchestrated by Donald Segretti and others paid by Creek. Think of it, Creek and Nixon's private attorney. November 7, 1972, Nixon is elected to a second term, defeating the uh, candidate George McGovern of South Dakota. Nixon wins 49, 49 out of 50 states, gets 520 electoral votes, 61% of the popular vote, beats McGovern by 18 million votes. But there are storm clouds brewing. And the real story of Watergate starts in 1973. Nixon wins a victory in November, but was it worth it? Well, that story will continue in 73 and 74. Meanwhile, Vietnam continues. New Zealand and Thailand pull their troops out of Vietnam. The United States continues to participate in combat, uh, assisting the South Vietnamese Army in negotiations in Paris and the war continued to fizzle. The war drags on. On January 1st, 1972, there were 1,000, uh, there were 100,000, 113,200 members of the military, men and women in South Vietnam, down from 500,000 in 1968. And Jane Fonda goes to Hanoi. Jane Fonda's in Hanoi. And she goes there. What? She should be in jail. Well, I'm not going to discuss that, but I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. Jane Fonda accepts an invitation from North Vietnam. During her two-week stay, Fonda concluded that America was unjustly bombing farmland in areas far flung from military targets. She made several radio announcements over the voice of Vietnam radio to implore U.S. pilots to stop the bombing. Fonda occurred the wrath of veterans and politicians. Um, before I get to uh, Henry Kissinger, you had mentioned she should be in jail, yeah. right? How many have thought she should have been in jail? One, two. Remember I met, mentioned Harvey Schiller a couple minutes ago? Harvey Schiller flew missions in Vietnam, 66 to 67. Ted Turner's right-hand man at Turner Communications. Ted used to take him everywhere. Ted was married to Jane Fonda. Harvey said that was rather uncomfortable because every time Jane saw him, she ran the other way. Harvey finally said to her, listen, Jane, stop. You can't do this. Just stop. And basically said he took an oath when he went into the Air Force to protect all Americans. And she had a right to be in North Vietnam. He had a right to like her or not. But he felt it was time to grow up that she should not be running away from him. Many veterans still feel animosity against Jane Fonda. I did that talk on the cruise ship. I had five Vietnam veterans tell me how much they hated Jane Fonda to this day. Uh, Henry Kissinger meeting with the Vietnam delegation. Uh, the Paris Peace Talks, December 13th, 1972, going nowhere. They break down. Uh, meanwhile, these are some of the scenes in Vietnam with civilians going on at that point. December 18th, Nixon decides let's have a new bombing campaign. It would last until December 30th. Three-day bombing, up to 120 B-52s. Strategical uh, surgical strikes planned against airfields, transport targets, uh, supply depots in and around Hanoi and Haiphong. That would eventually work. Meanwhile, in Munich, the Munich 11. 
Terrorism comes to the United States living rooms for the first time ever. ABC, Jim McKay, broadcasting uh, from the 1972 Munich Olympics, the Black September terrorist group gets into the Israeli borders uh, in the athlete's village. The massacre, this is what you saw on TV. So this guy with the mask coming in and out. The day of terror begins at 4.30 in the morning, Munich time, 10.30 New York time, September 5th in Munich, September 4th in the United States. Eight Palestinian militants affiliated with Black September, a militant offshoot of the Palestinian group Fatah, scaled fences surrounding the Olympic Village in Munich. Disguised as athletes and using stolen keys, they forced their way into the quarters of the Israeli team. About 10 o'clock at night, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, New York time, September 5th, the Germans believed they reached an agreement with the terrorists. The terrorists led their bound and blindfolded hostages from their quarters into buses, transported them to waiting helicopters. They were going to an airfield where the Germans planned the rescue mission. Jim McKay was on the air, Jim McManus over at ABC. He was on the whole time. What you don't know about Jim McKay, he was swimming. They told him, just put a shirt tie on and a jacket, don't worry about it. keep your swim trunks on, we're not going to show you from the waist down. He was on for 14 hours describing the terrorist attack. Howard Cosell was also on with Peter Jennings, but it was McKay who did the bulk of the narration. By 12.30 on September 6th, the shooting stopped. The 20-hour reign of terror was over. 11 Israelis, 9 athletes, 2 coaches killed. One Munich policeman killed. Five black September terrorists were dead. Three of the gunmen captured. At three o'clock in the morning, McKay summed up the tragedy and the outcome of the botched rescue with these words. They're all gone. Afterwards, Walter Cronkite sent him a letter saying he did the journalism industry proud. Jim McKay. The German authorities never did storm Building 31 in the Olympic Village. They allowed the terrorists to take the hostages by helicopter to a nearby Air Force base. The Germans planned an ambush and rescue operation. They bungled it badly. The nine Israeli hostages were killed by a combination of terrorist gunfire, a hand grenade that one of the Palestinians set off in a helicopter as it sat on the ground. Nixon was very irate extremely irate. He sends a telegram to Avery Brundage, International Olympic Committee chairman, who happened to be friends with Adolf Hitler in 1936-37, to the point where he built Nazi buildings, office buildings in Washington, for their staff in 1937. Nixon said the game should be called off. Avery Brundage said, no, the games must go on. There was a memorial service, September 6th, where Brundage announced the games would go on and was a pep talk for the games. Uh, Brundage said the 1936 Hitler Summer Games in Berlin, finest games ever. He would be a central character in Germany's Olympic history. Uh, Avery Brundage offered 27 words of encouragement for the Israelis, 27. That was Mark Spitz, remember Mark Spitz? I interviewed Mark in 1999, seven medals. seven medals. I interviewed Mark in 1999 about this very occurrence. This is my interview with him. Mark Spitz won seven gold medals. He was spirited out of Munich to London in fear. He was a high value target of the terrorists. A news conference celebrating his achievements was canceled. The swimming program had stopped, Spitz told me. I swam all the events. And that evening, the last day of competition was on Monday. This happened on Tuesday, on the morning. Swimming was through, so I didn't have to compete anymore. I had a press conference afterwards on Tuesday, and that's when everyone told me about the Israeli tragedy, or the thing that was happening at the time. It hadn't turned into a major tragedy at the moment, at least at that time. They didn't know much about it. The next day, I was whisked away. Brundage? 27 words of support to our Israeli friends. Brundage uh, resumed the competition 34 hours later. He was eventually replaced as the IOC chairman. That's George Wallace. George Wallace is assassinated 
on May 15, 1972, by Arthur Bremer, 21-year-old busboy. Bremer was target was Richard Nixon. He figured he couldn't get to Nixon, but he could get to Wallace. Wallace is having a rally in Maryland. Uh, he was 21 years old. After the after Wallace is done, he goes up to Wallace, shoots him three times, paralyzing Wallace from the waist down. Bremer wanted to shoot and kill Richard Nixon to capture world attention. He abandoned the idea when he realized that Nixon was too well protected. And then he went after Wallace, who's known as a segregationist. And there's Bremer being arrested. Traveled to Maryland to a Wallace campaign rally. After the candidate finished speaking, he went through the crowd, took out the 38, opened fire, striking Wallace in the abdomen. Wallace would recover, but was paralyzed. Wallace would win two Democratic primaries after this. Michigan and Maryland, but would drop out of the race because he was shot. Bremer was convicted on April, on August 4th, 1972, 63 years in prison. He spent 35 years at the Maryland Correctional Institute, was released in 2007 at the age of 57. That's Londonderry, Ireland, Northern Ireland. 13 people were killed, 15 people wounded after members of the English armies Parachute Regiment opened fire on civil rights demonstrators in the Bogside, primarily Catholic part of Londonderry. That was on a Sunday in January 1972, known as Bloody Sunday. In 2019, Northern Ireland's Public Prosecution Service said there was enough evidence to prosecute one paratrooper. All these years later, 47 years later, known as Soldier F, for the murders of James Ray and William McKinney. This all started in 1969. Catholics were tired of being put down by the Protestants and the police. Their skirmishes in London there in 1969. It would escalate, escalate. British troops were only supposed to be in Ireland, Northern Ireland and London there for three weeks. They stayed until 1998. They Senate Majority, one time Senate Majority Leader of the United States Senate, Maine Democrat George Mitchell brokered a truce between the two sides in 1998. In August of 71, there was more escalating violence in Northern Ireland, and British, uh, Brits had a new law, and they told authority to imprison people without a trial or internment. Uh, the troubles continued until 1998. We end up, Bangladesh gains independence from Pakistan. Cameroon gains independence from France and Britain. The bombs continue. December 18th, five days after a breakdown in the peace talks, Richard Nixon announces the Christmas bombing of North Vietnam. The B-52s go out there, drop 20,000 tons of bombs on Hanoi and Haiphong. The United States lost 15 B-52s, 11 other aircraft. North Vietnam claimed 1,600 civilians were killed. The bombings end December 29th. North Vietnam goes back to the peace table. That's how the year ends. Well, I'll give you a preview of 1973. June 27, 1973, Richard Nixon finally achieves peace with honor. Nixon signs the Paris Peace Accords, ending direct involvement by the United States in the Vietnam War. The Vietnamese accept a ceasefire. And that is the end of an eight and a half year war. That was the year that was, 1972. And if history repeats itself, it always repeats itself. Anyway, thank you so much. Any questions or comments? No questions, no comments. Okay, well thank you. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you.